interview Dr. Desai. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ellen, for that kind introduction. It's so great to be here. And gosh, Jonathan said, I think 750 attendees. It's just truly amazing. Well, my, it's really my pleasure today to be speaking alongside Russ and Mark, two very accomplished physicians in so many different ways. And I'll provide my perspective from the standpoint of the heart as we talk quite a bit about the brain in regards to stress and burnout, the heart is very much involved. Well, once upon a time, there was a doctor who was part of a large multi-specialty group. The doctor truly thrived. He was connected socially to his family, to his colleagues, to his patients. Then one day, one of the partners left the group suddenly and that person shared call with this doctor. So the doctor was left to take call every day, every day, for almost a year. So you can imagine what then happened. Tireless nights, no nutrition, limited exercise, withering relationships, just went down the spiral. So one day, it was a Wednesday, this doctor was supposed to go to surgery, had a surgery in about 30 minutes. And the doctor woke up and basically said, I can't do it anymore. I can't do it anymore. He was frozen, yet he felt his heart just racing, sweaty, nauseous, really out of sorts. And then he had this very brief realization. There was one person that he could call, his mentor, the man who hired him, an amazing man. So he picked up the phone and with a lot of anxiety, he called. And Rich answered the phone and this doctor said, Rich, I can't do it anymore. I'm supposed to go to surgery in 30 minutes. I just can't do it. And this doctor felt like a true shell of his former self. And then these magic words were said by Rich Jacob. Asim, you don't have to do this alone. We got your back. You take time, whatever time you need and will welcome you back with open arms. So why am I talking about this story? This is my story, and I think it's the story of many of us at this conference and around the world. Burnout happens in a variety of different ways, and it's really, really sneaky. It's really subtle. In fact, if you look at this curve, the Yerkes Donson model, and you go from states of calm to eustress, which is good stress, to distress, which is bad stress, you have this shape. And many of us have experienced that when we're doing well in our job, when we're performing well, when we're totally connected, we have that edge. There's stress, but it's good stress. And you don't really realize that maybe you're not sleeping that well, maybe not eating that well. You're so excited about what's going on. And that's how I felt initially. And then before you know it, your body and your mind start, start draining and you can head into this area of fatigue and exhaustion. And then of course, our institutions, our health systems, there's a lot of challenges, as we know nowadays, about getting institutions to look at us as healthcare providers and realize that we are the healers and we need to be healed. So our stress response is really twofold. I'm gonna be talking today about the brain, the heart, the stress response, and ways in which we can hack our own nervous system and our heart to help manage this. That is our discussion today. That is our conversation today. And so if you look at stress, you have an acute stressor. It then triggers your cerebral cortex, then triggers your hypothalamus, and you have two branches. You have the sympathomedullary system, which is your acute response, and then you have your hypothalamic pituitary axis, which is your chronic response. Well, that's enough basic science for me. I had enough of that in medical school. But let's take this model, this model, and use it to just realize that when we have stress, when we're burned out, it's not mental. It's physical. It's physiological. And that's why we can't get down on ourselves when we get burnt out. Because there's a lot that's not within our control. And that's why we need our colleagues and our family and our support network to help us. 
And so in the stress response, we have this dance, this autonomic balance between the sympathetic fight or flight response and the parasympathetic, the rest and digest response. And the vagus is a critical part of the parasympathetic response. And a lot of what's gonna be talked about at this meeting, whether it's meditation, mindfulness, diaphragmatic breathing, social connections, all of these things activate your vagus nerve and calm down that fight or flight response. And we'll be talking about the vagus nerve. So traditionally, we thought of the autonomic nervous system as binary. You had the sympathetic and you had the parasympathetic. So you had your fight or flight when you were stressed out and then you had your rest and digest and rest and relax when you were calm. Well, a different take on that was started by Dr. Stephen Porges and adapted by Deb Dana, the polyvagal theory. And really what it's saying is rather than just sympathetic and parasympathetic, we have a hierarchy. We have a hierarchy in response to stress, in response to the arousal state that our baseline homeostatic state as people is in social engagement, we're social creatures. And in that place, we are connected, we feel safe, we feel joy, we're grounded, we're curious, we're compassionate. There's so much being talked about about compassion at this meeting. We're self-compassionate, we're compassionate with others. This is our natural true self. And then stress comes in. And the stress takes us into our fight or flight response, our sympathetic nervous system. And it can initially start with feelings of worry and mild anxiety, and it can escalate very quickly into panic. That's the flight. The fight, it can start with frustration. You're getting phone calls from the hospital. You're getting into too many meetings. You don't feel like you have any time for yourself but then it can really escalate into rage. That's what happened to me. I, I found myself just getting more and more abrasive and just very much not myself as I went through this fight or flight response. And then you get to freeze and you remember that story. I was in bed waiting for to do that surgery and I was frozen. I was frozen because I was in this, in some ways near death state. The freeze state is what animals go through when they're under so much stress. It's what humans go through when we're in such severe depression that we just shut down. We feel helpless. A lot of trauma, a lot of trauma that happens at an early age results in this kind of response, a feeling of helplessness. We as physicians, we as healthcare providers, we feel helpless in the context of burnout, in this epidemic, in the midst of a global pandemic, this burnout epidemic, until ultimately you start to dissociate from your own experience as a coping mechanism. And that descends into shame, and ultimately feeling trapped. Well, there's a way out. It's important to recognize these are always going to exist. There's always going to be stress. We can learn techniques. We can learn technologies. We can learn from each other. There's so much that's been discovered by science in terms of the control that we do have. And that's what we need to focus on. How do we control our response? So if you look at Deb Dana's model of a ladder and the autonomic ladder, our base state, our homeostatic state is that ventral vagus place where we feel connected to the world. When I was thriving and passionate in my calling as a doctor, and then you undergo stress and you go from that calm to use stress state initially, and then it can descend quickly into distress. We're in the sympathetic nervous system, we're in danger we're in threat, we need to run or fight back until eventually the stress gets so bad that we descend into that freeze state. And so your vagus nerve, and the reason why it's called the polyvagal theory is your vagus nerve has these two components. It's got the ventral, which is the front part, and it's got the dorsal, which is the back part. And as I was preparing for this talk, I have to admit as a cardiologist and as an electrophysiologist, I do catheter ablation for a living for AFib. And this was a wonderful opportunity to learn about this and to learn from my colleagues and to learn from Russ and Mark today. And I am so grateful to be a part of this community today in learning about the state of how we can descend and ascend this ladder. And so our vagus nerve, I mean, it innervates our whole body, right? And we always think of it as sort of efferent, you know, that the brain is sending out through the vagus signals to the rest of the body, but more signals are actually afferent going from the body to the brain. The heart has an intrinsic nervous system. The gut has an intrinsic nervous system, the enteric nervous system. 
And these can take in stimuli from the outside world, from the inside world, and send it to the brain. There are studies that show that the cardiovascular response to stress, to stimuli, can precede the brain's response before there's processing that occurs. We know about the broken heart syndrome and how acute emotional or physical stress can change the shape of the heart muscle called Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. So it's amazing this interplay, this dance between the two organs, the brain and the heart, the heart and the brain. A stroke is like a heart attack. A seizure is like a cardiac arrhythmia. And the vagus, we encounter the vagus every day in electrophysiology. We use it to stop abnormal heart rhythms, for example. And so we can hack that vagus nerve. We can get back to that state of ventral vagus social engagement at homeostatic state by hacking the vagus nerve. And a lot of it is through awareness. And whether that's breath awareness with breath work, whether that's a meditative awareness, focused breathing, mantra, based meditation, thought-based meditation, walking meditation, awareness, sensory meditation, and then a body in movement, body as in yoga with breathing coupled with movement or physical aerobic exercise activating your vagus nerve. And then you have C, connection. That is the third way you can hack your vagus nerve. Connection comes in two flavors. Number one, connection is to ourselves and to the world around us. And that can happen through compassion, through self-compassion. That is what connects us. And so the ABCs, we're used to thinking about airway, breathing, and circulation as physicians when we arrive to an emergency situation. This is our emergency situation. We can hack our vagus nerve with awareness, with our body, and with being connected. So the heart and the brain, this beautiful connection between the two organs. We heard from two of the leaders Christine, at the start of I'm this sorry, meeting. I'm sorry, I'm gonna give you a, a warning for, you have about a minute left, and I'm so enjoying these slides and your talk. <laughs> So Thank you I'm so much. I'm sorry I have to cut you off. <laughs> this is what we're talking about, too passionate. Well, we're going to go real fast, but we're going to be purposeful. Heart rate variability, it's an amazing parameter. I encourage you to learn about it. We can talk offline. It connects your brain and the heart. It's available in wearable devices. We have HeartMath. It's a company that creates a device that incorporates emotion, breath work, and heart rate variability to monitor your state of stress and to help you transition to a better place. So in summary, we can go from stress to control. We can learn about techniques and technologies. And I got back to medicine. I went back to medicine. I am so grateful to Providence Mission Heritage Medical Group and my hospital for welcoming me back. And there's life beyond burnout. I was frozen in that bed. I'm married to my best friend. My call to action for all of you, go from airway, breathing, circulation to awareness, body, and connection. Don't be shy asking for help. It doesn't mean you're weak. It means that you're wise. And Brene Brown told us, our experiences can be the survival guide for another. Thank you to all the people that were involved in the summit. And I'll leave with Arianna Huffington's wonderful quote, the purpose of human life, no matter who is controlling it, is to love whoever is around to be loved. Thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you so much. I'm going to see if, uh, are you allowed to share your, your deck, your slide deck with the audience? I am more than happy to. You just tell me how okay. I'm supposed to do it. And I am more uh, than we happy will. to. We'll let you know and I'll let the audience know. And thank so you. thank you so much, Dr. Desai. It was really excellent to hear you. Um, and so we're going to go over to Dr.